Malta. So, those of you familiar with the country will know that Malta is made up of three little islands in the Mediterranean called Malta, Gozo, and Camino. Malta and Gozo, the two inhabited islands, are home to around 420,000 people. It's considered quite densely populated for an area measuring just under 400 square kilometers. Its visitors and its many residents enjoy an abundance of sun and sea, but it has also been home to numerous stray dogs and cats, which in the past have had little attention paid to them. Okay, so why was Malta chosen for this project? Well, back in 2008, the SPCA, which is uh, Malta's oldest and largest rehoming center, contacted Dogs Trust in hopes of starting a joint initiative. After many meetings and much research, the plan was set to put in place a five-year neutering, chipping, and educational campaign. It was understood that in Malta there was little animal welfare education and therefore little regard for it. There were numerous stray dogs and cats and unwanted litters of puppies being found abandoned. And a public opinion survey had showed that there were around 60% of people who thought that neutering was cruel. And only 15% of people had actually neutered their dogs. What's more, the majority of dogs were latchkey dogs, or dogs which were left to roam freely throughout the day. So in June 2009, it all began. Dogs Trust Malta was officially registered as an NGO with just two employees working from an office, mapping out a strategy and preparing to launch. Now, in order to run a successful neutering campaign, it was essential for us to get the backing and gain the participation of the veterinary community. So an agreement was set up where we would pay a certain amount for the neutering and chipping procedures. Now, at the same time, we were beginning to contact all of the rehoming centers and learning how we could work more closely with them. We were in frequent touch with the Government Animal Welfare Department, and we started to contact all the public, private, and church schools, as well as the Ministry of Education, in order to get our foot in the door. Our full-time education officer would be delivering free workshops to primary students on responsible dog ownership. Now, by this point, we had estimated that there were around 50,000 latchkey dogs and around 3,000 strays. And many of the people that we spoke to did not even understand what neutering meant. In fact, in the Maltese language, a word for neutering does not even exist. But the plan was set. Dogs Trust and SPCA would launch a pilot offer in the capital city of Valletta to people on means-tested benefits so that they could neuter and chip their own dogs for just 25 euros. It flopped. <laughs> we wasted no time at all figuring out that asking hard up people to pay for a procedure they'd never even heard of, let alone think was safe or useful, was just clearly a non-starter. So we changed tactic. We began offering free neutering and chipping to people on benefits, to farmers, hunters and factory dogs. And we focused a great deal on educating the public on responsible dog ownership. Now, as time went on, we started to see a new picture forming. We started to see that a large portion of the stray dog population was coming from the open farmland where these dogs were left to roam freely and mate as they please. Some had as many as 65 dogs on any one given farm. There were many dead puppies strewn across the fields, and many of them were severely underfed and in terribly poor conditions. Now, on this particular farm, we found about 12 emaciated dogs, several pregnant bitches, and a litter of puppies kept in a rusty old barrel, lying on a bunch of carcasses covered in maggots. That dog's leg needed to be amputated. So Dogs Trust needed to adapt. We quickly converted a van into a transport vehicle and started bringing these farm dogs to the vets for neutering and chipping ourselves for free. Now, we were initially met with aggression, with many people brandishing their shotguns and yelling for us to get off of their properties. It took a certain way of talking to these people to get through to them, often having to explain that they could save themselves the cost of a bullet that they would usually use on shooting an unwanted puppy. So we developed a strategic approach. We started sourcing farms from the northeast to the northwest of the country, moving our way toward the, the southern tip. The team would spend days on end 
traveling from hidden away farm to hidden away farm, finding dogs in terrible conditions. But it worked. <laughs> and farmers began to talk amongst themselves. And it soon became clear to them that there was no catch. As the farm dog neutering picked up, we needed to have a dedicated clinic where we could bring these dogs to. So we employed a vet from the UK and stationed her in a charity clinic so that she could do these dogs for us. Now elsewhere in the animal welfare realm in Malta, changes were happening. The media was picking up on stories um, on animal cruelty, which was unusual in the past. The story of Star, the dog who was shot in the head and buried alive, made such an impact it inspired people to come forward and join the animal welfare movement. Later, the story of Gaia, the boxer who was tied up in a garbage bag and dumped in a skip, barely alive, sent ripples through the media world. This is Star whilst in recovery. Unfortunately, she hung on for just a few weeks and sadly died of an infection. Gaia died shortly after she was discovered. But the authorities were taking notice the public outcries and the protests were actually making an impact. Heavy fines were being imposed and long jail sentences were actually being given, which was a first for the country. And in June 2012, Malta took a big step forward and introduced mandatory microchipping. People would have to microchip their dogs within the year or face a fine of up to 300 euros. Soon, we were struggling to find any unneutered farm dogs. And now, to date, we have neutered over 14,000 dogs. Quick look. There we go. A public opinion survey, which we just held last month, shows the true impact of the project. Where in 2008, only 15% of people had actually neutered their dogs, today, this figure stands at a staggering 74%, or 70.4%, rather. So, quite amazing jump. And in 2008, where only 15.6% of people had chipped their dogs, incredibly today, this number now stands at 92.6%. And when asked if people had noticed a decline in the stray dog population, an overwhelming 92.8% said yes. So whilst it was clear that we had reached a maintenance phase of the project, there were still other areas that needed attention. Now, education plays the biggest role in all of the work that we do. And with our work in particular, in, especially within schools, it started to pick up. And to date now, we've actually seen about 46,000 students. We held school competitions and outings to vet clinics. We did individual work with students that needed it most. And we also held workshops for scout groups and also targeted the older generation. So we did visits to residential homes and also homes for the disabled. Okay, so the, the team worked tirelessly to obviously get the message out there to anyone and everyone about responsible dog ownership. But we were still receiving phone calls with people complaining about their badly behaved dogs. It seemed that despite having this wide reach in education, there was still more that needed to be done. So we, re we launched the Dog Training Made Easy campaign. And for several months, we gave out thousands of free clickers, which we heard about before, with simplified instructions on how to do it, and held workshops in the local towns so that people would know how to deal with simple behavioral issues using positive reinforcement. We created a website, oh, which is back there. Hold on, there we go. We created a website called dogtrainingmadeeasy.org where we featured videos on proper training featuring our own Carolyn here, and also created our own in-house videos on clicker training. Now, the educational campaign did very well for us, but it was useful for those dogs already with behavioral issues and didn't quite tackle it, preventing it from happening in the first place. And statistics were already, to sh were already showing that people were less inclined to adopt a dog from an animal shelter, and that buying dogs was becoming more and more fashionable. Unfortunately, so was backyard breeding. And it was during one of Carolyn's talks that I first learned of the puppy plan. And the instant I heard of it, I knew it was our solution. <laughs> now the puppy plan, which Carolyn will go into more depth about now, is a socialization and habituation program for the first 16 weeks of a dog's life. 
It is the opportunity for breeders and early caregivers to give the puppy the very best start so that they would already be accustomed to what would be expected of them in older life, something which we found in Malta many dogs were struggling to cope with. Right there. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Um, what I wanted to do was just talk a little bit about the puppy. Um, can you hear me? Um, is that working? Can I borrow Yeah, you want mine? Okay. I'll use this one. I'll use this one. That's all. I'll use this one. Is that working now? Can you hear me now? Lovely, thank you. Um, so the puppy plan, I started looking at the puppy plan about five years ago because like a lot of behaviorists and trainers, I was seeing an awful lot of clients with their own dogs and also dogs in rescue with behavior problems that really they should never have because they could all have been prevented. Um, and the majority of this prevention the majority of this prevention can happen in the first few weeks of a dog's life. And in the first few weeks of a dog's life, you've got this really special opportunity to prevent the behavior problems that arise from fear. And the majority of dog behavior problems arise from fear. It might not be what reinforces it, and it might not be what maintains it, but it's nearly always where it starts. I mean, there's the obvious ones. There's noise phobias, fear of loud noises, separation anxieties, fear of being left alone, reactivity, fear of being in strange situations. But then there's also the aggressive behaviors as well. Um, and while it's quite easy for us to think that aggressive dogs are aggressive because they're dangerous or unpleasant, nearly all the time these behaviors come from fear. Um, resource guarding, fear of people taking your stuff away, Dog-to-dog -dog aggression, so fear of strange dogs. Reactive on-lead aggression, which is probably one of the most common behavior problems we see, fear of strange dogs when you can't run away. Um, Dog-to-human aggression, fear of strange people. They nearly always come from fear. And then you also get those dogs who don't learn easily. Um, Anytime a dog's feeling fearful, they go into the fight-flight response because they've got adrenaline flooding around their brains. And when you've got adrenaline in your brain, you can't learn. And we all recognize the fight side of that because that's really obvious. Um, but the flight side, we don't always recognize. We quite often think that's just dogs running away. Um, but quite often, dogs can mentally run away as well. And an awful lot of those shut down quiet dogs that are really, really hard to motivate are also like that because of fears or anxieties. Um, so an awful lot of these behavior problems, the behavior problems that come from fear, we can prevent. And we can prevent them with adequate puppy socialization. Um, it's kind of become a buzzword socialization now. Everybody talks about it. Everybody knows that they should be socializing their puppies but actually not that many people know what it means. They kind of just think that it's just having a dog that will get on with people. And maybe it's because it's misnamed. We talk about socialization, when what we actually mean is socialization, habituation, and early learning, early education. That's what we're actually looking at when we talk about socialization for it to be useful. Most people understand the socialization bit. That's easy. That's, hang on. That's introducing the puppy to all the things that we want him to have a positive relationship with. So that's people, all kinds of people. So babies, toddlers, children, men, women, people in silly hats, um, people with umbra. I don't know why I look like a bloodhound in that. So I don't know whether I'm socializing into bloodhounds or to people in hats. Um, people with umbrellas, people who are maybe a bit louder or look a bit different, all kinds of people. And then obviously we want to socialize them to other dogs as well. Not because we necessarily want our dog to play with all other dogs that he sees, but if he sees another dog, we do want him to be relaxed and calm and not reactive. That's kind of the socialization bit, and so many people think that's all there is to it. 
Um, one of the things they do have to remember is that socialization always has to be positive. Um, in other words, a puppy has to have a positive experience. I was talking to somebody with a 10-week-old German Shepherd puppy a couple of weeks ago, and she was saying, no, I've socialized my puppy to children, and I know he's going to be really, really fine with children, because the children can pull him around by the tail and yank on his ears and put their fingers in his food bowl, and he doesn't mind. Well, actually, at a time when the puppy's learning to be social, he's now kind of learning that children aren't great things to have around. Socialization always has to be positive. What a puppy's learning in these early weeks is he's learning what's safe and what's dangerous. So that's the socialization bit. But the other bit that people really don't understand and don't know much about is the habituation bit of it. Um, habituation is introducing the puppy to the fact that there's an awful lot of things in life that he can just ignore, that they're nothing to do with him. Um, that's all the things like fireworks and thunderstorms, and household noises, and televisions, and traffic, or any of those things that are going to become part of a puppy's day-to-day -day life when he grows up, because he can learn that they're not scary. Um, that's the bit that people just don't understand. If you want to know how habituation works, any of you who have heard me speak before will probably have heard me say this. Um, and I kind of hesitate to do it at an animal welfare conference, but I'm going to suggest that you all go out and do some animal experiment experimentation, which I know is a little bit dodgy, but next time you're out and about and you see a snail, pick the snail up and blow on it. Um, and chances are the snail will go back into his shell because being blown on could be dangerous. So he'll go off back into his shell, and when he comes back out again, blow on him again because that's just the sort of people that you are. Um, and he's going to go back into his shell again, but next time he might come out a little bit quicker. And if you repeat that over and over again, in about five or six times, you'll find you can blow on that snail and he won't go back into his shell. You have successfully habituated that snail to being blown on. You've taught him that being blown on isn't dangerous. Um, and that's a really, really, that's how habituation works. That's habituation in action. Um, but with dogs, we've got a really, really small window when we can do this. There's a real short window of time when we can habituate dogs, because they're much more complex than snails. We expect them to live in a much more complex world. And so this window of opportunity is much, much smaller. Um, and the reason for this, I'll, I'll go back on that actually, the reason for this is twofold. First of all, there's a really early point in the dog's life, and only this time in the dog's life, when he's learning the soft skills. And the soft skills are the skills of social interaction, of communication, conflict resolution, problem solving, and these behavioral competencies. In other words, just how he relates to the world around him. And there's a really small window of opportunity for this. Um, it absolutely fascinates me that the brain of a 16-week-old puppy is 10 times bigger than the brain of a newly born puppy. He doesn't get any more brain cells. Those brain cells don't increase in size, but that tenfold increase in brain comes from all the experiences that he has that produces connections within the brain, neural connections, as a result of everything he sees, feels, smells, hears, and tastes, that is going to decide how he relates to the world around him, what his experiences are. And by 16 weeks of age, 85% of that dog's brain has already been created. The reason we've got such a window of opportunity is because all animals are neophobic. In other words, they're scared of new stuff. Anything that an animal doesn't know, hasn't recognized, he's going to be frightened of in the future. And in a wild animal, that kicks in at about 19 days. Because nature assumes that everything that that animal is going to experience in the whole of his life, that he's going to have to be used to, he's going to come into contact with in that first 19 days. So the first 19 days of life, he'll go up to things and go, wow, a lectern, that's really interesting, and won't be frightened of lecterns for the rest of his life. After 19 days, he'll go, whoa, 
a lectern. OK, I'll be over here, because that could be scary. Because neophobia is that self-preservation instinct um, that stopped rabbits bouncing up to wolves and going, hey, Mr. Wolf, and getting eaten. It's the self-preservation instinct that means that you can't get anywhere near a wild animal. They'll either run away, they'll hide, or get toothy and attack you, depending on their personality. Um, and for a newly born animal to be neophobic would be counterproductive, because every single thing they encounter is new. They'd be in such a state of stress, they'd be so panicky. So you have this window of opportunity where everything can be accepted as just being, yay, this is part of life. And in a wild animal, in the wolf, the dog's wild cousin, this period is about 19 days. And if you watch a wild wolf with her cubs, she will introduce that puppy to everybody in the social group, all the different environments that that puppy is going to live in, all the different things that is safe. Um, but with domestic dogs, we've managed to push this period back a bit, this neophobia period, this period where we go, whoa, that's scary. Um, and in average dogs, that's seven weeks. Um, that's about the period. In the average dogs, about seven weeks, that's when that hazard avoidance kicks in. That's when instead of going, wow, what's that? They go, whoa, what's that? And everything that you can introduce to them in this period, while they're still accepting of everything, before they become fearful, they're going to be less likely to be worried about in the future. All the noises, all the sounds, all the sights, different textures to walk on, different things to eat out of, different experiences. And you've got this really short window. When I say average dog seven weeks. You have more reactive breeds, like your German Shepherds, your Terriers, that we as humans have intentionally bred to be reactive because it's useful for us. Um, a reactive dog will warn us of things that are approaching. Um, a reactive dog will act faster, act quicker. So your German Shepherds, your Terriers, they become start to do all this hazard avoidance period right down at 35 days. Labradors are right up the other end of the world. That's why they make fantastic family pets, because they're not particularly reactive. But on the average dog, it's about seven weeks of age. And that's the time the puppies are still with the breeder. It's really important that the breeder, or whoever is looking after those puppies in the first few weeks of life, can introduce all these things, all these sights and sounds and tastes and smells and experiences for the puppy, so that when the puppy grows up, he's met all of these things and just think, this just isn't scary. This is just, I can be really, really relaxed about this because I've met this before. And of course, we can't introduce puppies to all the things that they're ever going to encounter in life. But the more new things that they meet, the more new things that they encounter in this really, really important period, the more likely they are to be less fearful of things in the future and of new stuff in the future. So we've got this really, really short period of habituation, which is the time that puppies are still with the breeder. So it's really important that breeders, people who have these puppies in these early weeks, know the importance of introducing the puppy to all the things that could possibly produce fear when they get older. So that is, say, the noises to prevent your noise phobias. Periods are being left on their own to prevent separation anxiety and let them know that that's safe. All the different sounds, smells, sights that they're going to experience in life. Socialization has a slightly longer period. That goes on till about 12 to 16 weeks in dogs, depending on the breed, depending on the type, depending on the individual. And so not only does that socialization, the meeting loads of different people, loads of different dogs, have to happen when they're still with the breeder, it also has to continue on with the new owner. The new owner has to make sure that the puppy gets introduced to all the things that are going to be part of his life, part of his family, who he listens to, who he's social with. And also there's a sort of use it or lose it thing in dogs, and dogs don't generalize very well either, so they can carry on with all that habituation. So that's what the puppy plan is designed to do. It's a 16-week program that goes from pretty much birth up to 16 weeks. And for the first few weeks of life, 
the first eight weeks of life, the breeder or whoever has the puppy in those early weeks has tasks to do that they tick off, take photographs to prove that they've done it, and then pass it on to the new owner. The new owner then carries on with it, ticks off all their tasks to help have a well-educated puppy. It was launched officially at Crofts, so in March this year, and it's a joint project by the Kennel Club in the UK and by Dogs Trust. And one of the advantages is, because it's been so well supported by Dogs Trust and the Kennel Club, it is free. It doesn't cost anybody anything. Anybody who has a litter of puppies or anybody who takes on a new dog can sign up to the puppy plan. It's web-based, so there's no books to buy, there's nothing to print out. It's all on the website, um, and you get the tasks that you can do, that you can fill in online for the breeders or for the early caregivers, and then can move on for the new owner, for them to take over, and just to help raising puppies without all these fears and without all these worries. Um, I presented a talk very similar to this at a an group of animal welfare organizations, and they said to me, that's really, really good, but can we have a puppy plan for the adolescent dogs and the adult dogs that we've got in our shelters? No, of course we can't. This period, this period when dogs can take on all that information is fixed. 85% of a dog's brain growth is complete within 16 weeks. The adolescent dogs that you have in your organizations, the adult dogs that you have in your organizations with behavior problems, they are the products of bad or absent socialization and habituation. And now what you're looking at is behavior modification, desensitization, counter conditioning, management. It is far too late for those dogs. What the puppy plan is, it's an investment for the future. It's an investment for the dogs that you have all yet to see. The dogs that will come into your shelters, that you'll scratch your heads over, and that you'll break your hearts over. Um, the ones that shouldn't be there. If the canine world can get behind the puppy plan and can promote the puppy plan and get excited about it, because we've actually got a chance to stop problem behaviors before they happen. We've got a chance to make noise phobias, separation anxieties, fear-based aggressions, shut down dogs, unusual for behaviorists to see rather than commonplace. So if we can be proactive rather than reactive, we have a chance of preventing the majority of behavior problems that we see. Every behaviorist will tell you, you see a bad, difficult behavior problem, and the first thing you will think of is why on earth has this not been prevented rather than us trying to cure? Um, behaviorists will tell you the hardest behavior problems to cure are noise phobias, separation anxieties, the problems that come from real fears. Um, but much as, because the Kennel Club in the UK are involved, it's very easy to think that this is just for breeders, but it's not. Anybody who has a litter of puppies, who's rearing a litter of puppies, can take the puppy plan and can make it work. Um, and I presented the puppy plan to Sarah in Malta and to the team in Malta, and they just went, wow, we can actually do this, and we can make a difference. And probably Sarah and the team in Malta are the ones who have done it in rescue, have made it work in rescue, and Sarah can tell you about just how incredibly well it can work in rescue. Oh, yes, because we've only got one. Sorry, just bear with me a second. There we go. Right, come back. Yes. Great. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay. So now we know what the puppy plan is all about. So what did we do with it, and how can it be useful to you in your facilities? Well, we already knew that the puppy plan was extremely useful, but we needed to get it ingrained in the minds of those who needed it most, the breeders and early caregivers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, comprised, we put together a strategy which comprised of two phases. The first was to tackle the breeders and sell the idea to them. And the second was to launch it to potential new owners. Now, before we contacted anybody, we decided to put the puppy plan into action ourselves. So we took in a pregnant bitch named Tolfa, and uh, with a, no time at all, she whelped, and the team looked after her and took care of her and implemented 
the puppy plan at every stage. So we filmed the entire process and we created a tutorial of sorts which the breeders could use as a step-by-step -step guide. All these videos, by the way, can be found on that Dog Training Made Easy website under the Puppy Plan tab. We posted the daily activity on our Facebook page so that people could engage and follow the process. We adapted the booklets into Maltese and English, and we also created mock journals so that the, the breeders would know what would be expected of them. And still before contacting anyone, we got in touch with the two clubs who were responsible for registering breeds. So the Malta Kennel Club and the Canine Federation were both contacted to get their endorsement and to put their, their name on it. We also contacted the Ministry to get their stamp of approval, and we received the personal endorsement of the Parliamentary Secretary. But we still needed a carrot, something to hook them on the idea of the puppy plan. The fact that it added value to their, their litter of pups and gave a higher standard of, uh, of quality, as well as increasing the breeder's profile, still wasn't enough. So we took on an insurance company and we got them to basically offer free insurance for one year to any dog which was bought or adopted, i.e. on the puppy plan. This would help in ensuring that people wouldn't just go with the cheapest option, but also those with, with a good freebie. And with that, we were ready to begin. We started to attend all of the dog shows, and let me tell you <laughs> that it was not easy. We were not welcomed with open arms and warm smiles, but you know, we persevered, and <laughs> within time, we began to be socially accepted into that circle. We sent out puppy plan packs to every single breeder that we could find, and we set up seminars for them on the puppy plan itself. We created a Puppy Plan Facebook page, and it would be a place for breeders to be able to share their accomplishments and show their experiences and even ask any questions that they may have. We made it as simple as possible for them, even creating sample bags where there'd be different textures and different materials that they could use to introduce it in their own circumstances. Very soon, we were conducting our own inspections at breeders' premises and we were, we were um, issuing free certificates to those who had passed the plan. And in March of this year, we officially launched it to the public, where we were encouraging people and potential new owners to get a dog which had passed the puppy plan, whether for sale or whether as adopted from a shelter. We explored every marketing opportunity that we could find, and we also offered free workshops in the local towns so people could learn more about the puppy plan and what would be expected of them in the second eight weeks of them doing the puppy plan at home. We worked with the local councils and local artists to create free street art, and it was painted and it was not done at any cost whatsoever. In fact, we had a sponsor to cover these costs. And we created puppy plan signposts which we put in the local dog parks. Okay, so, but we didn't want to stop here. The puppy plan could still be made even more user-friendly and accessible to anybody who used it. So we decided to create an app, a puppy plan app. This app, which will be available on Apple and Android, will be available hopefully in the next month or so. And it is a way for people to document the process of the puppy plan and making it as simple as possible for them. Okay, so we'll have a sneak peek of what this is going to look like. Here we go.
Okay, so probably many of you have already realized this, but you are already introducing the puppy plan in one way or another in your own facilities. Okay. So you have the opportunity to have these litter of puppies already cared for, looked after, and regularly checked. So what can you do to implement the puppy plan in further? Well, in this case, do what you can within the appropriate week. Now, even if you have a dog which is older than 16 weeks, some of the socialization patterns can still apply. So there are a number of things like you, that you can do, like enriching the environment, introducing um, different textures and surfaces, a balance board, getting them to meet different people. All of this can be useful. Now, document what the puppies have experienced. This is a great tool, especially for when potential adopters are coming to view these puppies. And once you've started implementing the plan, get the backing. Contact the clubs and those who are responsible for registering these breeds. Get them to put their name on it and get them to back it in full. Be willing to put all differences aside to actually work on something which you can both agree on, which in this case is the future of all pups. Speak to the, your government or ministry and get them to back it. And find a partner to make it more appealing. See, we understood that it's difficult to implement the puppy plan in full in a shelter because you might not have pups there long enough. So what we did was introduce free insurance to anybody who was adopting a pup from a shelter who could show that they continued the second eight weeks at home. Okay, now send it to all rehoming centers and get them involved. Use the media. Send in articles to your local papers, contact local radio shows, TV shows, get yourselves invited. And use your backers to promote it through their media channels. And don't forget to use online resources like Facebook and Twitter. Okay, get sponsors. The puppy plan does not have to cost you a penny if you've got the right backers for it. Okay. And engage with the public. Let them know that you are the information hub and that they can come to you for any and all information. You, they can rely on you for the correct info. That's the most important thing. And understand the public. What are their concerns? You can try creating an online free survey to be able to compile this data. And most important of all, stick to it. <laughs> Change may not come quickly, but it will come. If you are going to be the leaders in curbing backyard breeding, you have to be willing to not give up. Now, Dogs Trust Malta ends its five-year project this December, and we leave our partners, the SPCA, to continue the good work that's been done with the neutering program, as well as the education with the puppy plan. I'd like to thank them for their support and wish them the best of luck. And to everybody here, if you have any questions or you'd like to do something similar in your facilities, please speak to either of us also here, and we'll be more than happy to help. Thank you.